Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black. Healing through storytelling. Welcome to Unbroken, the podcast with me, Madeleine Black, where I am speaking to the amazing people that I know and have met along my journey. People that have really been through some tough times, but have come through and are now thriving. And today I know you will love my guest. I'm speaking to Mary Turner Thompson. Mary was a business advisor for the Scottish Enterprise Network, married with three children and owned her own home. Then in April 2006, she got a phone call from her husband's other wife. Not only was he a bigamist, but he was also a con man who had ripped her off for under 200,000 and had left her 56,000 in debt on credit cards he had taken out in her name. She was left homeless, broke, and unemployed with three children to support on her own. Rather than letting it break her, she decided to use the experience for good and wrote her first book, The Bigamist, which came out in 2007. Her second true crime memoir is being launched on the 1st of March, titled The Psychopath. Mary is now an international best-selling author and speaker, able to talk about topics from recovery to psychopaths, as well as a writing coach and publishing consultant. Welcome, Mary, to the show. How lovely to have you here. How are you? Lovely to be here. I'm very, very well, actually. Uh, just just got over a nasty virus, which had a bit of a cough and a uh, loss, loss of uh, smell and taste and uh, dizziness and, you know, all sorts of lovely things. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, not COVID. I had two negative tests. <laughs> It's another virus that's going around doing something similar. Either that, or it's it's mutated to the point that they're not getting not getting a positive test. But you know, I'm on the mend. So that's, that's the good to good hear thing you're again. on the mend. So the yeah. first question that I always ask everyone that comes on the show is, what does the word unbroken mean to you? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, it it means you know continually continually fighting, continually going on. You know, sort of like it doesn't mean you're not dented. It doesn't mean you're not, uh, you know, sort of like you're not knocked back. It's it just means that you continually fight. I guess that you continually keep moving on. Yes, um, that answer. That's a great one. It's been fascinating hearing everybody's different uh, interpretations of that word. So it's it's great. So you met um, your ex husband. I know you don't like to refer him by name, but we know he was Will Jordan online, didn't you? Yep. Absolutely. In the year 2000. So, I mean, it was it, it was a brand new, brand spanking new technology that we had. And, uh, you know, so I was a, a single... Yeah, I was a single mom. I had a one-year-old daughter um, by a normal relationship that just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just, you know, my friends had said, you know, there's this newfangled thing called online dating. Why don't you try it? What could possibly go wrong? Um, famous last words. Um, and uh, so, you know, so this was a new way of meeting people. So I did try it. And I did it for about a year uh, and I met three different people, none of which worked uh, and then kind of backed off. And then out of the blue, I got this, this email from this very charming, um, charismatic, attractive chap. Mm -hmm. And we, we hit it off and we um, started dating and we got engaged and married. You got engaged just a few weeks after you met really, didn't you? Yeah, he asked me to marry him within, I think, two weeks of actually meeting physically, uh, but a month of, uh, of actually first starting talking. And at um, the time you didn't question it, you just were swept along with it all? Oh no, I said no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said absolutely not, I haven't known you long enough. Uh, and in fact, I was at the time I was furious with him because he just stood me up for a date. Um, and then he sort of pitched up in the morning and I was, I was standing there ready to dump him. Mm -hmm. Um, and he produced this teddy bear with a diamond ring around its neck and, and asked me to marry him, which completely sidetracked the conversation where I was dumping him. Yeah, we'll um, <laughs> but, it's a, but yeah, I didn't say yes. I, I, I said, absolutely don't know you well enough. So he told me to keep the ring until I decided. Um, but you and, did, uh, you did. Eventually. Yeah. Yes, and you did get married, yeah. and you we were engaged then... for two years. Okay. Um, so we got married two years later. So yeah. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of one of those misinter mis misinterpreted people thought you think we got married very quickly. We didn't. Yeah. We actually, you know, we got married two years later. <laughs> we cleared that up. But and then you had two children with him, didn't you? Your daughter. Yes. Son. Yes. Uh, which was miraculous because uh, in the uh, very first email he sent me, he told me that he was infertile through mm. a bad bite of mumps as a child. Mm. And it was a miracle. And, and that's what yes, you just believe that it was 
you know, just a strange yeah. phenomena that actually maybe his infertility was cured or? Well, you know, when, when I did it, when I told him I was pregnant, um, he he literally turned white and kind of leaned against the wall and looked like he was about to pass out. And he said, you know, you know, it's a miracle. So uh, I, I was always told there was one in a million chance, but never, you know, just that, that never to expect it. So you had two in two million chance. Mm, we did. We did. Yeah. And uh, it just the, the whole thing was that we actually had a miscarriage as well. So it was a uh, three, three um, pregnancies by him. Um, but uh, there was, I, it just, <laughs> even his parents rang me to say congratulations on having their first grandchild and how excited they were and et cetera, et cetera. So. <laughs> and what did he tell you that his work was? He was an IT consultant initially. Uh, and uh, I went to his offices in St. Andrew's Square and he had a whole team working for him. Um, and he was this IT specialist. He was say he, he told me initially that he would hack into people's um, bank accounts, uh, not bank accounts, hack into people's business to see whether or not they were hackable. Okay. And that was what his supposedly his, uh, his specialism was. Uh, after a few months of being with him, things started to go a bit odd. And then he actually confirmed to me that he actually his he was doing that kind of thing but he was actually doing it for the intelligence services mm -hmm. so he he was <laughs> working for the central intelligence agency the cia uh but it was um it was he was one of the guys in the van mm -hmm. he wasn't a spy he was he was one of the tech support guys and, and you didn't have any reason to doubt him at that point well there was an awful lot of proof actually uh, i mean i did doubt him when he first told me i mean it's a long story as you, as you know mm -hmm. um but i i did doubt him but he just said look hold off there'll, there'll be proof you know there'll be proof coming so just wait and see and so there were there were people that would contact me saying you know now that i was in the in the loop as such mm -hmm. uh there were people that would contact me and say you know that he'd been called away so you know he didn't stand me up he just he you know there, there were people that could tell me that he was got away he used to carry a gun he was paid in money packets paid you know it was on secondment to the mod so uh, he was paid in money packets that were stamped with the mod there was just lots of different things that actually did prove that he was who he said he was uh not least that um in 2005 five years later he was actually working in the deputy prime minister john prescott's office mm -hmm. uh, and i actually went into the westminster office with him and things like that so there was lots of things that kind of verified what he did was true some parts of it yes mm. and then not that long <laughs> after that 2006 you get this call from this woman who says yes. how many years has she been writing 14 years and had how many kids together yep we we were married for six years they'd been married for 16 so mm -hmm. that she was actually married for to him 10 years longer than i was and was his legal wife as far mm -hmm. as we're aware and um, where, where was she? Was she in America or she was in the UK? No, she was in the UK. She was in England. Okay. Um, so, uh, but it turned out she had five children to him. Uh, their nanny had two children to him. He had a child back in America. We knew of 10 children at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I now know of 14. Uh, the latest was born on the 1st of August 2019 to a 19-year-old. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he, at 2005, we worked out, he actually had two wives and five fiancés. Um, the man yeah. actively impregnates women to rip them off for money. That's what he yeah, And does. he preys on single mums, really, or, or yes. vulnerable women. But yeah. just take me back to that phone call. When this woman phones you and says, are you Mary Turner Thompson or whatever? I I'm married to your husband. <laughs> I can't imagine <laughs> receiving a phone call like that. You must have thought. Who's winding me up? What's going on? No, well, the thing was, I, I, this is about the most bizarre part of this part. I mean, trying to tell this story is really tough because it's actually so, I mean, this is why I had to write the book about it because it took 60,000 words just to explain what happened. Uh, and sort of like trying to do the headlines is like some sort of one of those, um, uh, you know, sort of like Hello Magazines or whatever articles of like, <laughs> sort of like met a guy online. He told me he was CIA. I believed him, gave him all my money. Yeah, it's you know, it's, it. it, it's far more to it. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, getting that phone call was weird, but it, it was the end of an awful period of time because from about 2004, um, things had started to go horribly wrong. You know, he tried to get out of the CIA. He had, uh, somebody had discovered where his real family lived uh, and we were effectively being blackmailed by people yes, that, who- that's what he told you he needed the money yeah. for, didn't he? Just, yes. So, just... you know, I sold my flat, I sold my house insurance, I sold my uh, my life insurance, I sold my piano, I sold everything I possessed um, to raise money because I was told that basically these people were going to kidnap the kids and rip pieces off them and send them through the post to us unless we paid them. Um, so getting this phone call, um, 
which is what surprises people. The phone call is not the drama. The drama came beforehand. The phone call actually was the get out of jail free card, okay. you know, because finding out it was him and there weren't these shadowy people that were after us and, and trying to kill us. You know, I'd been living in fear for two years. I hadn't slept properly. I hadn't, I was completely brainwashed. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, co coercive control is now against the law, but in those days it wasn't. Um, but it is exactly what he did to me. It was, it was just systematic, you know, brainwashing and control. And he, he took everything. He, he'd taken every penny I had. Um, Yet he and, was the uh, father of two of your children. Yes. He didn't just do it to you, he did it to his kids as well, which yeah. is really hard to understand, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a, well, I mean, I, one, one of the things in writing the book that I came to understand and doing the research is that he is a psychopath. He's not, he's not just an average guy, uh, you know, who's a con man. I mean, his crimes, he's, yeah, he's not just a bigamist, he's a con man. He's also a convicted paedophile. Yes, uh, that's a whole other story. Was, you discovered he was a sex offender, didn't you, that he yeah. had assaulted it? really young child yes so uh, he had he went to jail for uh convictions against sexual offenses against girl under the age of 13. Mm -hmm. so um but he was so i mean there was all these different things i mean there's the definition of a psychopath is criminally versatile mm -hmm. you know so he was a big mr con man he was done for fraud not registering his address under the sex offenders act he's been done for carrying uh throwing stars impersonating police officers He's, you know, I mean, the, the guy is just <laughs> literally he, criminally. He was off. charged, wasn't he, and put in prison in the UK. Yeah. And so he, he, he was given a five year prison sentence. Yeah. Uh, and he, that was in 2006. He, he did two and a half years and then was deported straight from jail back to the USA, mm -hmm. uh, where he immediately went back to doing exactly the same thing all over again. So because, because I, the book was published, because it's now an international bestseller, I actually get contacted regularly by victims uh of his what, new what, victims and old ones what was shocking i'm very lucky i've read both books the second book is not out yet but i've read an advanced copy um uh -huh. you are an expert on the subject so i mean really it's, you know, <laughs> it's what well. happens when you become obsessed with something yeah. you know? <laughs> but uh unbelievable that you there are so many victims of this man that you yeah. now have a facebook group that's yes, how many yeah. women there are and yeah. that that was shocking to me so yeah. shocking and well it's more victims all the time you hear of new ones he's, yeah so he, he served another sentence in america because that's where he's from and when, yeah. on his release he's doing it again yeah oh he always will i mean it's it's like it's like smacking a cat or or telling a cat off for chasing a mouse you know, and put or putting it in a a basket and saying, you know, naughty, naughty cat, don't do that again. You know, as soon as it gets out, it's going to do it again. It's in its nature. You know, and psychopaths, that that is the their nature. They don't have empathy. They're not going to acquire empathy by going to jail. The only thing that happens by putting them in jail is actually you delay their actions in, in targeting new victims. You know, you can't have them in jail if they haven't committed a crime. So they do the time, they come back, they and they'll 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 do it all over again. But he will never stop. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not in his nature. It's just, it is who he is. And that's you know, what and you that's, say in the second book. That's the message. It's almost yeah. like a cautionary tale, your book, really. Yeah. Um, well, one, one out of a hundred, one out of a hundred people are out and out full-blown psychopaths. Mm -hmm. So, you know. actual definition of a psychopath, just for anyone that's okay. like me? So a psychopath is somebody who's devoid of conscience and remorse. So there are two points in the brain, uh, just behind the ears and, and back here, who, which if I snapped my finger in front of you and just went crack, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you'd even just saying that you did it yourself, you, you kind of, yeah. you flinch slightly, your eyes crinkle, you, your head goes back because you feel a physical, chemical, empathic response in your brain. It's like two needles going into your brain. You, ah, you know, you feel ow. Although you don't actually feel the physical pain, you actually have the reaction to it. And that is, a, that is a chemical empathic response. So psychopaths don't have that. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they are, it's either dulled or non-existent. And if it's, if it is non-existent, they therefore have no conscience, no remorse, no guilt, no empathy, no, no connection with other people that allows them to actually um, have any kind of reward structure. So you and I, you know, we get a hug from our children or our partners. We get, we get, you know, a dog comes and gives us a wee cuddle, you know, we feel that's that's a reward structure to us. Mm -hmm. We feel really good when we get a smile from somebody else. Psychopaths don't. The only thing that rewards a psychopath is money, sex, and power. Yeah. And it's like that's because it's measurable. Mm -hmm. And it's like they, as a result, they are incredibly bored. 
you know, nothing excites them, nothing interests them because they don't have that kind of reward structure. So to them, we are all Sims characters. We are all just playthings. We're yes. all just toys. We're, we're all rather playground, really, aren't we? Yeah, we're sheep to the wolf. We're just something to play, or or mice to the cat. We are just things to play with, mm -hmm. and that includes their children, and their parents, and their siblings. It includes everybody around them. I mean, you have and it... great, great insight and understanding there. But how has it been for your kids to come to terms with how their father is? I think the interesting thing is my children don't have any daddy issues at all. <laughs> It's like, I think partly because I, I've never been bitter about it. Okay. I've never, and I, I know weirdly enough, I've never been unkind about him. Um, and I've never kind of decried their genetics. I've never said, you know, well, he is, you know, I've said, you know, he has a chemical imbalance, a, a lack of chemical empathic and response. And you believe this is something he's born with. It's not something he learned yes. like becoming a narcissist or it's yeah. something that he came into this world with. Yeah. So a psychopath is born, a sociopath is made. Yeah. So a psychopath, a sociopath is somebody who, who basically from year zero to five um, is, give, is given no love no, and, you know, is, or, or a systematic abuse. And as a result, their empathy does not develop. Yeah. So they, by the age of 18, a psychopath and a sociopath are indistinguishable. They're the same thing because they're now cooked, if that makes sense. Yes. But, you know, sort of like, so, but... <laughs> ridiculously enough we can't identify somebody as a psychopath before they're 18 and therefore there is no help or support for any parents of, of those that can identify that their child might be like that mm -hmm. which I think is nuts but that's a totally another subject um you know so it's it's but as a result you know there's the psychopaths are born it's not that they are you know they're not damaged or anything else they literally just don't have that chemical response and people would find that hard to understand that you have no bitterness you know you just accepted what happened and just rebuilt yourself they you, you could imagine people would turn to anger quite easily but you've never allowed that i i was um and i'm quite open about it i'm sorry if it's shocking to other people because i know it is but i was i was sexually abused as a child mm -hmm. and i what happened to me from about four and a half to six stopped when i was six years old mm -hmm. and it was a friend of the family so it wasn't somebody i lived with or anything else but as a result, I suffered from the age of six to the age of 26 with all the self-loathing with, you know, because I participated in this game. And every time somebody talked about, you know, childhood sexual abuse or if I, any I said to somebody I was abused, they would say, oh, my God, how awful. That's really terrible. That's awful. You must have been so, you know, terrified. And I wasn't, you know, I participated in this game with this guy and had kind of enjoyed the attention. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was wrong. Yes, it was damaging. But I realized after 26, I realized that that stopped when I was six and everything happened from six to 26. I did to myself mm -hmm. and I chose not to be a victim again. I but chose and I said, I'm not doing that again. Will Jordan is out of my life. I'm not going to spend another 10, 20 years torturing myself for having been conned by him or having been groomed by him or having been brainwashed by him because I've done that. But I am not doing it again. But that just shows your resilience, doesn't it? And your refusal to be a victim again. And yeah, I think, I think you have a choice and how we respond. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you do. I think, but I think it's, it, it almost takes that first mm -hmm. level of abuse and recovering from that to know that you can recover from so something. You've got that strength. How yeah. did you find strength? Because there's been so many articles, so many documentaries, so many TV interviews, radio interviews. If you go type in Mary's name, you'll, you'll just be there all day. Um, <laughs> how did you cope with the negative online stuff? People really keep oh, being yes. stupid. How did you not know? Da, 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 da. You know, oh, really oh, the, the, there were some really stuff. lovely ones. I mean, re yeah, well, I, I mean, sort of like, I think one of the ones that, that offended me when in the early days was somebody who said, well, she's so ugly that, you know, she couldn't possibly get anyone but a psychopath. And I just thought, not really. Um, no, I, I think there are, I mean, what was so fascinating in the second book, I, I came to sort of understand something that I hadn't in the first one. And that is that there are people that review my book and just go, oh, how stupid are these people, you know? And the thing is that the, there are, that these people, you know, would probably never be caught by a psychopath because they aren't empathic enough. Yes. And a psychopath, the first thing they do, and I'm, I'm very highly empathic. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was something I wasn't aware of. There was a scale of empathy as well as there's a scale of psychopathy. But um, the psychopaths target empathic people because they'll say, oh, I had a terrible childhood. And an empathic person will say, oh, they're there. How can I help? Mm -hmm. Whereas non-empathic person will say, well, what's not, not my problem. Yeah. So they never become a target of a psychopath. So they're kind of right in the sense of they would never, it would never happen to them. But at the same time, you know, it does happen to an awful lot of people who are empathic. And, and these, as I say, Will Jordan had five fiancés and two wives that I know of in 2005. And he averages sort of five, five to ten women at once. So, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think there's a time scale I know where he wasn't at least three, having three partners uh, over the time that, that I know of his activities. So, you know, the, 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 these 1% of society, these psychopaths, are targeting far more than 100 people in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Far more. More like thousands. So if you've actually managed to cruise through life without being affected by a psychopath, you're actually very, very lucky. Yeah. You know. But these people, you know, the, the people that, that are critical are either very unempathic themselves. So they're sort of sitting between the psychopaths and empaths, in which case, you know, they're quite cynical, they're quite, you know, um, they're, they're quite immune from either side of those emotions. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the, there also there are people who, who are putting themselves at risk because they just don't know these people exist. And that's, that's where I was. I just didn't know people like that existed, which is why... You know, I didn't. I didn't understand what he was doing, and I didn't and, see the and red flags. It's very because of your very nature. That's why your radars were up there. You know, he could almost your vibration of what you're giving out. That's exactly what he tuned into. Yes. Yes. I was. I was. A, I was a mouse sitting there, going, "Come and chase me." Yeah. <laughs> you um, are very vocal now. You, you yeah. do speak out because you want to protect other women and warn people in society and to break the stigma that you have been conned. Yeah by this yes. person. Um, and you also went on tour, I believe, with someone speaking about this. Can you tell us about the show yeah, that you got involved that, with? That was quite fun. I did, a, I did an interview with a journalist called John Ronson in uh, 2007, and we did a, a show that was supposed to be six minutes out of a half hour show. Uh, and he decided, we actually talked for two hours in the studio, and he decided to make the um, our episode uh, about all about my story uh, and it came third in the Sony's awards and it was you know it was called the the internet date from hell I think um, and John and I kept in touch and he started doing a show in 2016 called the psychopath night with me as a special guest mm -hmm. and it was hugely successful we were selling out to audiences of 2000 plus uh, and we went on on the road three years in a row doing this thing called the psychopath night uh, but I uh, know, so I'm, I, I apologize. After the after the radio show, he actually went on to write a book called The Psychopath Test, okay. because he was so fascinated by the way I talk about psychopaths. So, which is and, and that that is you know that's uh, an internationally um, acclaimed book about psychopaths because it's a very good read. So, if you're interested in psychopaths, that's that's a good one to read as well. Uh, it's called the Psychopath Test. I think, yeah. Sadly, a lot of people go, "Oh my gosh, that explains." that you know oh, the yeah. former relationships or present relationships i think they'll it will make them you know think it's not me it, it's them yeah i mean i think everybody i've talked to every time i do a presentation people come up to me and say oh my gosh i've just now realized this ex, this is why this ex you know girlfriend or ex-boyfriend behaved this way suddenly it makes us this sense um and i've actually done when i've done um tv i did the right stuff and uh, one of the guys that was on the panel uh, came bounding up to me afterwards and says, you know, oh, you've just explained, you know, why my girlfriend way, behaved the way she does. Because it's not just men that can be psychopaths. Obviously, it's women as yes. well. Yes. Yeah, we the the, the theory is that only one out of four psychopaths are female. Okay. Um, and that's borne out in our um, criminal psychiatric facilities in the UK. We have four male and one female criminal psychiatric facilities. Personally, my personal belief, not that what the science is bounding out, mm -hmm. I think women are just as just as many psychopathic women as there are men. I just think women are better hiding it. Yes. You know, I think women hide behind mental illness when the psychopaths hide behind that mental illness and just say, oh, they had a breakdown or it was hormones or yeah, I think women are more political and I think they're probably better at being psychopaths than men.
Mm -hmm. So this, you're not touring obviously, but now with COVID and everything, but no. you toured for three years and was it always about your story or you spoke about different psychopaths on the night? No, or? no, it was, and it was completely unscripted show as well. It was, uh, I mean, John would literally just interview me on stage uh, every night for two weeks. Um, and it's just, and we'd never had a script. We had sort of certain jokes that sort of came up, mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it was great fun. I mean, it was just so much fun making people laugh. Yes, um, and that, that's what I love about you. And I've heard yeah. you speak. You you do laugh about it, and like yeah. you say, people think I can laugh again after losing everything <laughs> and being conned and blah blah. But you, it's good to see that you can laugh again. I think that's a really positive thing. To oh see, yeah, to see that you oh, can yeah. rebuild your life, and no matter what happened to you, you know, you've gone on and found joy again and a happy. Uh, Absolutely. I, one of the things is like that when I first wrote the book, somebody said to me, "Are you going to write it under your own name?" And I thought at the time, I thought, what an extraordinary question. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of realized that what they were saying is that I would be embarrassed about what had happened and I would want to hide it. And I just thought, well, if I'm going to talk about this, you know, <laughs> it's like I've watched enough EastEnders to know, right, that if I don't tell my kids what, what happened, they're going to grow up and they're going to come home with Mr. Wright or Miss Wright and say, oh, I've just met this lovely person. It will turn out to be a half brother or sister. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it was, there wasn't really an option to stay quiet. Um, and you know, it's either don't, don't talk about it at all, or I had to be completely open and I wasn't going to tell the kids they had to be ashamed of something because they'd done nothing wrong. Absolutely. So, you know, I had to kind of really stand up and just sort of force myself and say, I'm not ashamed of this and I'm not. And it's like, and it, over the years, you know, I, I have, I agree. I have, I was naive. Um, I was brainwashed. I didn't see the red flags. You know, I didn't know people like them existed, you know, but all these things are mistakes that people make mm -hmm. and not things that you should shame yourself over. And an awful lot of victim shaming is people victim shaming themselves. And I just, you know, I'd done that. I'd been there. I wasn't going to well, do it again. Perpetuated by the opinions of society, really, isn't it? The victim blaming messages that were fed. Well, you should have known yeah. better. You're an intelligent woman. You should have seen the signs, dot, dot, dot. Uh, but yeah, so it is but it's all blaming the victim and not actually saying actually the the con man is very, very good at what he does. Very you know, he had people system. supporting him, including his parents. He had people, you yeah. know, and, and that's up what's and, really hard to see, isn't it? When you had the phone calls from other people back and up and when his parents are, you know, congratulating you on their first grandchild, which is all lies. He yeah, they, they spent Christmas. They spent Christmas with the other wife and the five children only months beforehand. So they, <laughs> so they were part of his grooming or they just went along with his... I think, no, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, they're both in a home now, so we'll never find out. But um, the, but basically, I, I know a lot of the victims, and um, more recent victims as well, um, in America have met them and, you know, been told, oh, how lovely he's finally found someone. Um, so they are very, very complicit in what he does. And they have helped him set up people to, to give him, give him money. So I don't know. <clears throat> there is, um, there is a thing called an apath. Um, so you've got, I mean, these are all the sort of different categories. You've got narcissists, sociopath, psychopath, apath. Apath is, in a, as in apathy, is it's people who are have conscience and remorse, but um, they will do whatever a psychopath says to avoid being the target. So just to keep the peace kind of thing. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of sort of family members of a psychopath will be apath. So he's still pulling their strings, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. And really, they're just doing it so they don't, don't become the target. And so either they're benefiting financially from it or they're doing it because they don't want to be a target themselves. They're like a diversion kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And do you ever get tired of sharing your story? Uh, weirdly enough, no. It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, I used to, when I, when I first, <laughs> when I first started talking about this, I had a kind of compulsion to tell everyone the first rule of any abuser is keep your victim silent. Yes. So I'd been silent for six years. I hadn't been able to talk to anyone for six years. And I just, I, I totally rebelled against that. And I started, I would be sitting at a bus stop and somebody. Because the silence really hurts you and it protects the perpetrator, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And it stops you from being able to, if you can't articulate it, you can't actually make sense of what's going on and it's it's a kind of brainwashing technique as well yeah. but I'd be sitting at a bus stop and somebody would say good morning and I'd say good morning my husband's a bigamist 
You would just have to say it out loud. Any, any opportunity I got. And it either, it either resulted in people going, you know, sort of like, what? Or it would just, the people go, oh. And move away. <laughs> and move away, yeah. But yeah, so I did, I mean, initially, I just had this kind of compulsion to tell people. After I wrote the book, it, it got a bit easier. Um, but I, I did, you know, it, it was a kind of a really healing process. Uh, and talking about it, I mean, it's the best therapy in the world, isn't it? Sort mm -hmm. of saying something out loud and writing it down and, uh, and, uh, you know, but the fact is, you know, I don't mind sharing it. I, I often kind of like go, if I go, if I used to before COVID go to dinner parties or anything else, I, I don't generally tell people anymore. They say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a writing coach or a publishing consultant, or, you know, I help people publish books or something, you know, and if they say, <clears throat> if it comes up and they say, oh, you're an author, what do you write? I go, oh, it's a memoir. <clears throat> because it's uh, otherwise it just takes over the entire conversation. Yes. And the whole dinner party then be, you know, is about me. And then, uh, much as it's a fun, co fun topic to talk about, is so like, I do go away going, gosh, they must think I'm really arrogant because they're no. obviously talking about me. <coughs> Excuse no, me, I apologise. Okay. So when remnants, remnants of the virus. That's okay. When do we expect to get um, the second book, The Psychopath? When will that be published? When can we see it's, it on the shelves? It's out for pre-order now, mm -hmm. so you can order it straight away from uh, Amazon. Uh, or from any bookshop. It's called The Psychopath by Mary Turner Thompson. Um, I was amazed nobody else had actually taken that title. <laughs> but there you go. Um, and uh, but it's available for pre-order now. So um, and it's sorry, it's out on the first of March, okay. uh, twenty twenty-one. So yeah, very exciting, very exciting. It's, well, the Bigamous has done so well, hasn't it? Yeah, it's just a yeah. fantastic book. I've read both of them, as I've said, and I thoroughly recommend. If you haven't read either, get both of them. Uh, start with The Bigger Miss and then The Psychopath. They, it's such an insight into, yeah. It's that there's, there's, such there's such different books as well. It's like the, yes. the first one is very much the story. Yes. The second one is very much, well, it's partly the story of what's well, happened since. The second one is your it's... wisdom and your knowledge that you've now acquired. And you now are an expert, really, <laughs> in, in psychopaths. You really are. You've become this expert through lived experience. Well, yeah. And also because for the past past 14 years, I'm still fascinated by them. I'm still fascinated that there is this, this category of human being who is you no know, totally devoid of emotion and, and they're living amongst high us high functioning empath that you're fascinated yeah exactly <laughs> and it's i do think you know i do think it's very interesting and i think there's there's an area of uh research that you know that there's things that we could do to change i mean you you get a a, a high functioning psychopath in a political position uh and i can think of a few around the world yes. um and they change the whole you know, structure of society. Yeah. Um, you know, they don't all go become criminals. 25% of the prison population are psychopaths. 4% mm -hmm. uh, of CEOs are estimated to be psychopaths. Uh, so they're, they're, they're quite high, yeah. you know. Yeah, but not, not all psychopaths are really good at what they do, which is probably why 25% of the prison population are psychopaths. You know, so like a lot of them end up going to jail, in which case those are the only ones we can currently research. Yes. You know, but the, if, you, if we can start actually understanding the psychology behind it and what they're doing and, you know, uh, particularly if we can start identifying them younger, we can actually start helping the families of psychopaths the same way we do help the families of autistic children, mm -hmm. you know, so that they become functioning members of society. Um, and uh, it could change the world, you know, if we could do that, it could make such a big difference. Yeah. So just before we finish up, do you have any tips for anyone that's listening that it might have resonated with them and they're starting to think, oh my gosh, <laughs> what helped I think, you, you, know, you know, to get to where you are? Okay. So f first of all, um, shame is a big issue. Yeah. Um, and actually something that I've been researching a lot about lately is not only, you know, the victim shaming that other people do, but the victim shaming we do to ourselves. Yes. You know, we, we as women particularly feel shame um, if we're not uh, cooking all the meals, doing all the work, earning all the money, uh, being the perfect mother and doing it all with makeup all in place and our hair every, you know. Juggling all the balls in <laughs> the air. All and being perfect, time. being perfect at all of them. You know, and we do tend to shame ourselves if that's the case, you know, so, so first step, step one, drop the shame, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like, don't, you know, shame, shame is being, feeling bad about something we are, you know, guilt is feeling something we do. And that's fair enough. If you feel guilty about it, do something, but shame is, is a, is a 
bizarre uh, crippling emotion it's totally crippling yeah and it's uh because there's nothing really you can do about it so stop victim shaming yourself for a start start looking to the future start looking to today and enjoying today and going to the future um be aware of psychopaths and what they do and how they function because the more you know about them the less likely you are to be caught by one mm -hmm. and they're actually not so difficult to spot when you know the 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 signs mm -hmm. um and thirdly you know just just love yourself love yourself and and love the people around you don't have to be suspicious we all have to live in trust of other people so it's perfectly okay to trust people and it's perfectly okay to fall in love and you know etc it's like not you know one percent society might be psychopaths and 99 percent of them are not you know so oh. it's like yeah, that's a really good place to end on love. I think that's a lovely way to end. So just want to thank you, Mary, so much for coming on and taking the time to share your fascinating journey with us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Unbroken, the podcast with Madeline Black, playing now on all the main platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher for Android, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and here. Play Unbroken, the podcast, with Madeline Black.